Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Reyes Aguilar. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Just wanted to make sure we had the window up and running. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reyes Aguilar. I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid at the University of Utah's Quinney College of Law. Welcome to our uh, Spring 2020 application workshop. I hope all of you are healthy and safe and adjusting well to all the, the changes we're experiencing. I um, want to confess that this is my first attempt at a webinar for this event. We usually do this event live, so I'll ask for your your patience and good humor as we go through this together. I hope, uh, I hope it works out for all of us. I'm hoping this will be informative to you. There's a number of uh, changing parts to this whole process, uh, including for any of you who have recently registered for the LSAT and had the score canceled in March, um, some information that will help you hopefully plan a little bit for the future and let you know what we're thinking about as law schools evaluating uh, academic records, as well as some of the, the fluidity that we're facing in some of the programming. I do want to let you know that our uh, Associate Director for Admissions, Isabel Moreno, is joining us. She is a uh, part of the attendee list, so if any of you would like to have a chat with her, uh, while, uh, while this is going on, she's available. If you have questions that you would like to pose to me, I would ask that you use the question and answer uh, option on, the, uh, on the, the screens that you have available. I'll try to get to those. We've set the, um, the system up so that it pushes the most popular questions to the top and I'll try and answer those as we move along. Um, if I can, I'll answer the questions as they're posed, but if it looks like it's slowing things down, I really want to honor your time. Uh, if it is slowing things down, I'll probably hold off until I'm done with a particular section, and then I'll get to the questions as they are uh, relevant. Um, and with that, I'm going to switch to PowerPoint mode, and uh, so you guys can see uh, the, the information that I'm talking about. We are recording the event so just know that we're going to post this to our website and uh, it'll probably take a couple of weeks for the edit to happen but i'll show you the the portion of the website where we intend to have this posted so let's get started okay here we go there we go um, just want to acknowledge the members of uh, the admissions team at the quinney college of law uh, there's myself and Isabel, who I mentioned is on the, the 
the, the participants list. We also have an office manager. Her name is Susan Baca and uh, our operations manager. Her role in the office is basically marshalling your application files through the process. So if you have questions about the status of your application or whether elements have arrived that you are waiting for, she's the best person to reach out to and ask that question. And then the fourth member of our team is Jaron Smith. He's actually the associate director for student services. He handles primarily the uh, financial aid side of things for us, but he's also a great resource. He knows uh, the application process quite well. He's helped us out for about three, four years now. And then he also knows the school and the students quite well as a result of uh, his uh, uh, part of the student services team. I want to let you know a little bit about the future events uh, going on, uh, both locally and nationally. Um, we will be having fall visits. Our plan is uh, things work out with our current sequester, um, be up and fully running for fall semester. And in, in that case, uh, we will start our class visits and law school tours uh, the, the week after the holiday, the, the Labor Day holiday, uh, September 7th. And then they'll run to the Friday just before Thanksgiving week. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, tours and visits available during fall break. Um, and I don't know the exact dates for fall break other than I know it's currently been shifted to coincide with the vice presidential debate uh, for the general election. We're hosting that this year. Uh, we will have a, another application workshop and another financial aid workshop in September. We'll post those dates on our website in July. Just know that next week, same day, same time, uh, we will be having our spring financial aid workshop. Um, and uh, you'll be getting Zoom invitations or you should be able to, to request and register for that um, event. Um, let me go back. And so uh, there are law school fairs at uh, university uh, campuses here in Utah. Uh, the University of Utah is, is scheduled for October the 20th. And then BYU's law fair is scheduled for October the 21st. Um, Amy Urbanik in, is uh, the pre-law advisor at the University of Utah. She's also on the participant list. So if you do want to have a chat with her, know that you can pose a question or, or reach out to her there. Um, she did mention to, to, she did ask me to mention to all the participants that there is still pre-law advising going on. Uh, even though the campus buildings are closed and classes have gone online, her office can be reached and they're still providing advising services uh, through virtual meetings and telephone calls. And I'm quite certain that uh, the pre-law advisor, Christina, at, um, at BYU is also providing the same excellent services there, uh, primarily online. I also wanted to let you know about one of our sister programs at the University of Utah. The Department of Continuing Ed does have LSAT prep. Their sessions for the summertime tests, uh, they have two start dates in uh, May and then a, um, a June start date. Uh, you can see the ending dates for those are either in uh, June, in time for the June test, or August in preparation for the September test. Um, they are still working out what they're going to be doing, either live or uh, online prep. Um, so you'll want to reach out to them to, to find out what their plans are as we go through um, the um, stay-at-home protocols. Uh, there are website links that you, are going to be available there on um, the, the, the slides once they're once you can get into our website and we post these the presentation um, information is available online uh, do know that they offer a 20 percent discount for their LSAT prep course the uh, promo code for that is prep law and you'll and when you do the online payment you'll just get the 20 percent off there you can also register for a drawing to get a free LSAT prep course and it's that last um, uh, hot link on the bottom of the slide. Um, uh, there is an LSAT question and I'll get to that one when we get to that part of the evaluation uh, portion of uh, my describing the application process. Uh, future events include um, national forums. Uh, the Law School Admission Council hosts forums uh, throughout the United States major urban centers, and we participate in all of those. Those are some of the dates that are coming up for uh, the 2020 recruitment cycle. Our hope is uh, that we will be able to make the, the Washington, D.C. event, but obviously that's very close to the dates that are talking about. Um, events hopefully clearing up by summer, but we will see. Uh, LSAC will definitely keep these events updated on their website. 
Uh, speaking of website, this is our website. For more information on our admissions process, you'll note uh, the admissions tab. So as you click that tab, it will give you a drop down menu. And this is where you'll be able to find the video of my presentation today, as well as information on class visits and other events going on. Uh, in terms of the events, when you go to the events or recruitment page, uh, this is what will show up so you can see a calendar of what's going on uh, in any particular event where we will be or events that you can register for. And then this is the description for what occurs on class visits. I strongly encourage you, if you're able to, uh, to visit campuses as part of your law school application process. Uh, we do a lot to make our websites and materials attractive to, to uh, encourage you all to both apply to our program and if admitted to enroll, but there's nothing like the in-person visit that will give you the information you really need uh, to make a decision on if it's a good fit, if a school is a good fit for you. On our website, uh, the visits portion, we give you the instructions and also hopefully make it easy for you to register for a class visit or a tour. We offer the class visits every day of the week. Uh, and some days we have two classes that you can sit in on there. We do ask that you give us two days notice uh, in requesting a class visit just so that we, hit, we know we have enough seats available for those who want to sit and observe. All right, so um, requirements, basic requirements to um, apply to law school. Uh, first, uh, while you can apply before you have been awarded your bachelor's degree, you must have a bachelor's degree conferred from an accredited college or university uh, that is accredited by the, university, by the United States Department of Education, and that needs to be conferred prior to your matriculation into law school. It's fairly common that we have candidates who actually wrap up their undergraduate degrees during the summer. Uh, those students have to make sure that those uh, transcripts are transmitted to us uh, in time for classes to start. Uh, when that comes up or that issue is addressed uh, in the uh, commitment process in early summer where we inform them what they need to do to make arrangements for that. Uh, there's the law school admission test that must be taken. Uh, as part of the application packet, I do want to say that we are not a school uh, that uh, accepts the GRE in lieu of the LSAT. We are an LSAT exclusive school at this stage. And then there is this uh, service called the Credential Assembly Service that students must register for. Um, and I'll show you how that service works. In, um, in looking at a bachelor's degree, there's no major coursework or background that we require. So law is so interdisciplinary, we see the value in having a wide range of stu uh, students with a wide range of academic interests in the classroom. And so there is no um, major requirement. Uh, we do encourage and we look for when we evaluate those transcripts uh, that you've taken a, a challenging a level of coursework and hopefully that you've taken courses that have developed your communication skills your reading and comprehension skills and your logical your logical and analytical reasoning skills uh, those three things are actually what are tested on the lsat and then problem solving a big part of your work as an attorney is all about problem solving uh, for the LSAT, the nuts and bolts, uh, know that you register for the LSAT on uh, the Law School Admission Council's website. The fee for the LSAT is $200, and that includes one writing sample. If you choose to, to retake the LSAT, the uh, registration fee will not include a second writing sample. If you do want to take the writing sample again, it's a $15 cost associated with that. There's three parts of the LSAT, the analytical reasoning, logical reasoning, and reading comprehension portions. Um, there are sample test questions on the LSAC website. The score range is 120 to 180. As you contemplate taking uh, perhaps a commercial prep course, always ask the question about whether or not they use actual LSAT questions from previously administered tests. Uh, that'll give you an assurance that you're actually working with the types of questions that the LSAC is asking uh, and how they're developed. Um, uh, the, uh, the LSAT is offered eight times a year. Uh, for the 2019-2020 cycle, the April 25th is the last test of that cycle. The reason I have it highlighted in red is um, it's still a, a, a question as to whether that test will be administered. Uh, the March test was canceled this year, um, and the LSAC will make a determination as to whether they will cancel or postpone the April test very shortly.
They did acknowledge, and there was an email sent around to schools and people who were registered for those tests, that uh, this is a very unique situation. So they have provided an opportunity for those candidates and only those candidates who were registered for the March and April tests who happened to have taken the test in the past and had scores canceled to be able to resurrect a canceled score. And the thing that's very unique about this is the student will be able to look at that test score before they decide if they want to keep it or not. Uh, this is expected to be a one-time opportunity simply for to acknowledge the fact that the late cancellation of these tests are affecting candidates who are currently in the application cycle and don't have test scores to report. Um, I would not anticipate anything like this being done with any future tests, for example, in the summer. Um, or in the fall, even if they are um, going to need to be canceled. Uh, but ultimately, those are decisions to be made by the Law School Admission Council. Uh, for the rest of the test year, uh, in 2020-21, uh, there's the June 8th test, the July 13th test, um, the August uh, 29th, October 3rd, and November 14th test. And then after the new year, there's a January test, a February and an April test. Uh, the number of tests being offered now is double what it has been in the past. So for those of you who are just entering uh, this process and have been relying on older information, know that this is something that's just developed in the last couple of years, having the test offered eight times. Uh, there are Sabbath dates available for those of you who observe Sabbath on the dates that the test is uh, originally uh, scheduled for. The test is a digital LSAT and then it's administered on a tablet that is provided by the Law School Admission Council. So that's something to be aware of as you're doing your preparation. I strongly encourage you to become familiar with that platform and navigating uh, the test. Um, my understanding for those who have been taking the test uh, digitally, which began being offered in uh, July of 2019, so it's only been um, less than a year that since its first administration, that the navigation is actually um, easy to work with and they really value the opportunity and they find the time that is given by the LSAC prior to the test starting, um, plenty of time to, to set up the features on the tablet that will that you, that are most, most conducive to, to your style of using the tablet. The LSAT has changed its policy recently on the writing sample. Uh, you only get one writing sample as part of the LSAT test um, and you take it apart from the test. And once you're registered and you take the test, then you can do the writing sample. You cannot take the writing, uh, complete the writing sample prior to uh, having had the test administered to you. Um, uh, the writing sample is proctored. You need to do it on a computer that has um, uh, the capability to link to the systems that the Law School Admission Council has. Um, it, needs, it can be completed beginning on the day of the LSAT and have um, up to one year, although they're going to shorten that very, uh, rather significantly very shortly, if not already. Um, the CAS report currently is able to be generated with, uh, with uh, just one writing sample, and they are releasing the scores uh, and the cash reports uh, without the digital writing sample included. That is a recent change they made in this cycle. Um, after taking one full LSAT, candidates can take another writing sample if they want, but there is another administrative cost, and it's a standalone fee of $15. Uh, limits on taking the LSAT. Uh, three times a test year is all that you can take it. Um, five times in the past five years and seven times over a lifetime. Um, once a score of 180 has ever been achieved on that test, then um, uh, you're not allowed to take it any more within the last five years. Uh, the scores are available in about three weeks, so you might want to time out uh, or, or think about how you're sequencing your application and submission with that understanding. I personally always recommend that candidates know their test score before they submit their application, just in case they want to refer to that score, either in a writing sample or an addendum to their application. As I mentioned, we do not currently take or accept the GRE for admission purposes. 
Uh, the credential assembly service. Um, that's the service that compiles your transcripts, letters of recommendation, and reports the LSAT score to us. You register for that with the Law School Admission Council. I think technically it's called a subscription service. The term uh, that it is active is five years, and the fee for the service is $195 just to set up the, the account, and then $45 for each law school report that you have uh, sent out. Uh, so each law school is going to require a report. So it's uh, $95 for the service and then $45 for each school. Um, and then that's on top of the application fee that uh, you uh, are paying to the schools. With that acknowledgement, the application fee, I want to let you know that the we're going to send you an application fee waiver uh, for our application process. It'll be sent to the email that you registered for this uh, this webinar with. And so keep an eye out for that. We hope to get those out to you by midweek next week. Um, and the CAPS report, as I mentioned, summarizes your transcripts. It verifies their authenticity. It uh, reports your LSAT scores to us, as well as your writing samples. It also, uh, it also transmits your letters of recommendation to us, as well as the TOEFL score. So uh, virtually every law school is going to require that. Uh, while I mentioned we don't take uh, or use the GRE, for schools who do use the GRE, you're going to have to have the ETS or Education Testing Services send that report separately. Uh, the transcripts. So in terms of the colleges that you went to, you're going to have to have a transcript sent to us from every college you've ever attended, even college that you attended in concurrent enrollment as part of a high school program or seminary credits that may appear on a transcript. So for some candidates, um, it may take you a little bit of time and you'll want to start uh, early enough to give yourself plenty of time to contact all the institutions you've attended to ensure that those transcripts are in the offices with plenty of time for you to evaluate those. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. Uh, foreign transcripts. If you were directly enrolled at an institution outside the United States or you graduated from that institution, uh, and at minimum, if the total work that you've completed at uh, those institutions included uh, uh, reached uh, more than one year, academic year of a bachelor's level of the study, uh, you need to submit that foreign transcript. If that transcript was uh, generated as part of a school that you are attending uh, study abroad program, uh, that will be included in the transcripts that are submitted to the cash report. If you have questions about those, it's always best to refer to the Law School Admission Council on which of those transcripts you'll need to submit uh, from foreign study. And keep in mind that those transcripts must be sent directly from the institutions to the Law School Admission Council for the CAS report. And this is what the, the registration page looks like. Okay, um, for this application workshop, um, I'm gonna talk about four elements of this. I'm gonna talk about our early decision program. I'm gonna use a chronological report approach to how you develop your application and how we review. And then I'll walk you through our review process using the application file contents. Um, this question uh, from Daniel Berger about um, the GRE. It says, even though you don't accept the GRE, if we've taken additional tests, such as the MCAT, would it be beneficial to list our score anywhere? Um, I would say that's fine. I, I think it, you, you want to think about how you're going to be using it strategically. So I think um, sometimes we will get a mention of other test scores if somebody says they have a test history that suggests that these scores um, are not the, per, the appropriate instrument to measure their academic potential and if they have either an undergraduate test SAT ACT or another graduate school the MCAT or the GRE and they show that they uh, had a poorer performance on that test but excelled in school um, that's kind of the, the strategic um, use of that type of a test or that type reporting. But um, if you're using it to show that you've done well in another program and you didn't do very well in the LSAT, that's kind of, you're, you're trying to show that there's a contradiction in what the LSAT is reporting to us. Make sure that you know the other test you're using well enough so that um, you can point where, out where the differences are. Namely that, and, and understand that the LSAT is developed with those three factors in mind, the analytical reasoning, the logical reasoning, and the reading comprehension, which have been shown to be a, a very important 
component or a very important part of the education process and, 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 and having an ability to um, predict the academic success of a candidate. So, so um, you can report those, but be cautious in terms of how you plan to use them. Um, quickly, do you only consider the highest score or you, do you look at, all, at other scores? The short answer to that question is we will look at, uh, we do look at the other scores. And when we get to the cash report page that I'll show you, you'll see how we have access to all that information. All right. Um, early decision program. We do have an early decision program here at the Quinney College of Law. And it's designed for people who have identified the law school as their first choice law school. Uh, and what do I mean by that? It's uh, the easiest example I can give uh, in saying uh, or, or showing that we're a first choice law school is if in looking at this early decision program or apart from this early decision program, if you're looking at other schools and even if you got, in, if you got into the Quinney College of Law and you got into your second or third choice schools also, and even if those schools gave you larger scholarship amounts, your choice would be to go to the SJ Quinney College of Law then that's a circumstance in which the early decision program may be something for you. If you're thinking, no, I'd want to weigh all my options before I make any kind of commitment, then the early decision program isn't for you. It's, it's, uh, it's a program designed for people who have by, who have by far chosen um, the SJ Quinney College of Law as their primary or first choice school. The elements of that program, the early decision program, are that, are that it's a binding application process. Um, there's, and by binding, that means you're limited in the applications you can submit to other schools. Uh, so you can apply to our early decision program and submit application to other schools. You cannot apply, submit application to other schools binding programs. Um, and you sign the contract as part of the process that if admitted into our binding application, into our early decision program, you will commit to enroll. And that's what we call the EDP agreement, the early decision agreement, program agreement. Um, one of the benefits of going through this is um, it's an expedited process. And as the program name implies, it's early in our evaluation. As long as you submit your application by October 16th, uh, this year, it's uh, the third the third Friday in October, um, and our applications open up on September 1st, so you have about a month and a half to get that in. Um, you will have a decision from us by November the 6th, so you hear earlier than all the other candidates do who are in the process with us. If admitted, you are assured a scholarship. It's a three-year renewable scholarship. This year's three-year scholarship had a three-year value of about of just over $52,000 for residents of the state of Utah. To keep that scholarship, you just have to maintain good academic standing and uh, not get in student behavioral cold trouble. So it's uh, basically um, an unconditional award. This is the application uh, portion of, the, of uh, the, the website when you go into the portal to, to apply. Number three is the box that you check and then it'll send you to the agreement where um, you read uh, the elements of uh, the, the commitments you make and the conditions as part of the early decision. Um, and then uh, you, you print that out as a PDF and you mail that in as part of that application. So um, with the early decision uh, process, it's still the same process or the same criteria that candidates are reviewed under uh, and the same reviewers. It's just that basically um, the standards are higher. Uh, we've, this is the second year that we've gone through the program and those people who have been most competitive are um, uh, performing above the medians for our LSAT and GPA, at least one of those data points uh, in the application. So um, it's helpful to know that I think. Um, and um, in terms of the statuses, if you're admitted, you're fully admitted. That's kind of self-explanatory. Um, the good news in this status, this process though, is you can never be denied. If a candidate is not admitted through early decision, the file is simply transmitted to, into our regular process and, it will be, and the candidate will be reviewed under the, the regular process criteria. Let me look at the questions here and see what's going on. 
There's a question about the credit, no credit, especially at the University of Utah. Uh, and I will touch on that when we do the uh, file evaluation uh, element of our process, of uh, the, the webinar. Uh, this is going to deadlines, and so so we're segueing into that. Uh, the question is, um, I plan to take the LSAT on June 8th to complete my application for fall entrance of 2020. So that means this person is wanting to be in the current cycle. I've been told that applications will still be reviewed for admission for fall. Is this true? And I understand scholarship opportunities at that point will be limited. Yes, it's true. So our deadline, uh, that March 10th file completion deadline, is not a hard deadline. It's one in which um, uh, you're put on notice that your file, will, for people who have their files completed by that date, uh, they will typically hear from us no later than uh, mid-April, mid to late April. So there's time for them to find out what their status is before they're making decisions on other schools. Um, after that, it's kind of all bets are off, and we will try to get to those as, as, as time allows and space allows. If somebody's taking the LSAT as late as June, it's important to know that, one, um, we can't make a decision on the file until we get that LSAT reported. And you may recall from the previous slide that it's about three weeks before we get that score. And so you're looking at early July. So that's pretty late into the summer, especially with um, school starting in mid-August. So if the decision is to admit the candidate, um, there will be very little time for the candidate to contemplate an offer. Uh, before making a decision. And um, like the last state uh, sentence alludes to, usually by that time of the summer, all of our scholarship uh, budget has been fully subscribed. And so, especially with regard to merit funding, it's unlikely that the candidate will be um, able to be awarded a scholarship or if the, the person is awarded the scholarship, it may not represent the size that they may have been able to compete for earlier in the process. Typically we do, even that late in the process, have need-based scholarship money, so um, they're not going to be completely left out, but that's something to consider as you contemplate being later in the application process. So some of the deadlines uh, in the regular decision process include September 1st is when our application uh, uh, opens up. That's when the front door opens to let applications in. I always like to acknowledge that this isn't a race to the front door, um, that you aren't advantaged simply by being uh, the first person to submit the application. The, the, the thing that really drives the process is when is your file complete? Um, that alludes to that January 15th date. So the suggested file completion deadline or date of January 15th um, represents uh, the fact that uh, for everybody who submits a file and it's completed by that date, their file will be reviewed and if admitted, they will be assured of being part of our first round scholarship offer process. So uh, by being complete by January 15th, if you're admitted, you know that you're going to be a part of our scholarship review when we have all of our scholarship budget available. Um, but my caution to everyone is always that this isn't um, a process about time. It's a process about quality. I think even if you're going to miss that January 15th date uh, by a week or so or even more than that, it may be better for you to be a stronger candidate but late, later in the process than to have been an earlier candidate who rushed his or her application, but it wasn't at the highest level of quality that you could have produced. So I'll uh, just uh, caution in that regard. The um, file review order. Um, so we review uh, files um, using a rolling admissions process, but it is adjusted to push candidate files who have indexes at the highest level of um, our pool. And what I mean by that is, uh, we do have an index formula that uh, uses the LSAT, it weights the LSAT about 60% and the GPA about 40%. And the candidates with the highest indexes are kind of are pushed to the front of the line, in part because we want to make sure that um, if admitted, we have time to recruit those candidates because we know that other schools are also 
employing that kind of file review process. Uh, but in, by and large, uh, once we catch up to that part of the process, having had those candidates kind of move through, then its files are reviewed um, on a file completion basis when once files are completed or the read in the order of completion. Um, admission committee members, it's myself and the associate director uh, for admissions. And then if we need a third or fourth reader on the file, there are faculty members that serve on the committee. Um, everybody who reads a file and makes a decision on it is legally trained. Um, and that's one thing I think to keep in mind that your audience are people who read and write for a living, um, have been legally trained and are going through and having gone through the law school process themselves. And I think that's helpful to note. Um, committee members can vary from school to school. So as you strategize uh, about which application uh, you'll be submitting to where, it's helpful to know who your audience is, I think, and, and knowing um, with that audience um, who you're talking to. Some schools actually have students that serve on the admissions committee, and some schools have just single readers. Sometimes it's just the dean for admissions. Uh, other institutions actually have professional readers where they hire people seasonally uh, every year. Often it's the same people, but that's their full-time job, just reading files. Um, the voting process is one in which um, uh, the voting decisions are admit, waitlist, or deny. Um, and it's, uh, it's with uh, the primary reviewers uh, being myself and the associate director of admissions, we largely come to, to uh, uh, unanimous decisions. Uh, if, if, if we can't come into agreement, that's where committee members who are on the faculty will come into play and essentially break the tie. Um, admission statuses, uh, waitlist, uh, admit, or deny are those three statuses. One of the fun parts of my job is calling people who have been admitted. I will often call them uh, before we send out the letters. Uh, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, emails are sent out to everybody with regard to their statuses, however. And then for those who are admitted, there's a hard copy packet that's also mailed out to them with, with their admit letter and some additional information. I'm going to turn to the questions just real quick. One question is, will law schools be taking the LSAT considering the pandemic? Um, at this point, uh, I would say the answer to that is yes. However, depending on how long the pandemic lasts, if it goes into I'd say three or four test administrations. So if, for example, not only are the March test and potentially April test canceled, but if the July and June test end up being canceled and we have the potential of having a portion of the applicant pool having been unable to sit for the LSAT because summer was their last chance for whatever reason, um, I would say, well, I know that some schools are saying, well, what do we do? Um, do, do we look to have a, uh, what's called a variance from our requirement that there be an LSAT test uh, produced as part of the application? Uh, that variance would have to come from our accrediting agency, the American Bar Association. We haven't reached that point, um, but there is no doubt that if it uh, appears that we're heading in any kind of direction like that, you as applicants will get notice either through the law school admission councils portal or through the law schools themselves posting this kind of information on their websites. So I think uh, pay attention to what's happening on the web, pay attention to school websites, and just stay in the information line about something like this. Is it possible that application deadlines will be extended because of the COVID-19? Uh, sure, I think uh, that this is something that having gone through the Great Recession back in 2008 and in some ways still recovering from that, it's a good example of how schools have become more nimble in their process. And so just like what I said in regard to our application uh, deadline of March the 10th, well, that's the deadline for submission and there's assurances that go along with that in terms of how soon somebody will hear from us and perhaps having availability of scholarship money. I think most schools are going to be in a position to say um, we're willing to review candidates all the way through, you know, through the summer in making some of these decisions. Um, will those at deadlines or that review go all the way past the start of school? I doubt that. 
Um, but I think there will be more flexibility the longer we're dealing with the pandemic and, for example, stay at home orders uh, or having an inability to go take tests or even the issue of if you haven't already paid for it and you're finding that you've got financial challenges in signing up for the LSAT or CAS. Um, there's a whole host of issues that we as admissions professionals are taking into account about how we're going to move forward on these issues. And just like with the last question, I would say keep, make sure you're in the stream of information, pay attention to websites, pay attention to the school's websites in particular, um, and, and um, don't hesitate to reach out and ask questions like this. Good questions. Um, uh, I'll wait for uh, Emily's question on the evaluation once we get to the cash report. Does the applying to the EDP increase the chances of receiving a larger scholarship? No, um, that's kind of the trade-off. Uh, that that the EDP is scholarship is in the middle of our scholarships. I would say it's our it's our it's our smallest renewable scholarship, but we also have non-renewable scholarships to two categories of those, and so um, that's the exchange. If if a candidate wants to compete for our largest scholarships then the early decision program isn't, isn't the way to go. Uh, all things being equal, will a person who's 15 points above the LSAT median receive more money than a person who's only one point above the median since medians do not function in the same way as mean or averages? I think that might actually go to um, the idea of how uh, uh, schools target medians play into something like US News. And when you evaluate from that perspective, if a school is trying to move their median LSAT from say 162 to 163 or 164, the value of a 165 to that, else, else, to that school is no different than the value of that 163 LSAT. And so what, are the, what, are the, what is the willingness of a school to add more to a scholarship to attract that candidate? Um, just using the LSAT, not much, but that's kind of a false premise because schools are looking at much more and at minimum, they're looking at a GPA also. So um, I think by saying all things being equal, uh, would the would the 15 points make a difference? Well, even though all things are equal, does the person have a GPA above the medians from the previous year or not? Um, and then all things equal, um, does the person have a master's or PhD degree in another discipline, which adds a different kind of context to the contributions this person can make to schools? Um, it's 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 always a tough question to ask because even though the hypothetical is easy to understand that, you know, everything being equal except this one thing, how do you distinguish between the candidates? It's such a rare occurrence that um, it creates a, what I call that false premise. I think um, the, the big things are looking at the school's medians together and then contemplating what that school is trying to do. Uh, I will admit we're one of the schools that's trying to move up and what we're looking at are, are the things that the candidate brings uh, in regard to the numbers going to really help us and does this person have two numbers that are really going to help us? Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, uh, just ask a follow-up on that. Um, before I get to these, I'm going to finish up on notifications, letters, and then criteria. As we look at the criteria, uh, I'll show you the list of that, but um, in, in evaluating the criteria that a candidate submits, um, I think in the broadest sense, we're seeking to answer three questions um, in this process. The first question is, has this candidate demonstrated that she has or he has the academic skill set necessary to compete in and complete a program of our quality? And a program of our quality is, you know, we're a top 50 Pac-12 Research One school. Um, just in layman's terms, we're a really good school. So um, does this person demonstrate that skill set relative to, to um, being able to compete in a program like ours, compete in a program like ours? The second question is, um, how well has that candidate demonstrated that skill set relative to the pool that they're competing with? And that's one of the areas that really distinguishes candidates. I would go so far as to say, the vast majority of our applicants, uh, we would answer yes to on a very fundamental level 
for that first question. I would say 80, over 85% of our candidates, um, based on the index scores, we have correlation studies done on our students every year. And based on the predictive values of the, that are, of the index scores, um, at a very minimal level, 85% of our students have shown they can do the work. So really what distinguishes people are the next two questions. How well have they demonstrated that skill set relative to the rest of the pool? And third, what more are they bringing to the law school by virtue of their life experience, their backgrounds and their interests that will enhance um, the learning experience in the community that this person will be a part of for the next three years, that they're a student of ours, and the potential to contribute to the community and uh, the bar as an officer of the court and a graduate of our program. Two really broad questions. And when I say academic skill set, we're looking at these things uh, in the areas of personal uh, qualities, intellectual skill, integrity and honesty, communication, task management, and working well with others. Um, implicit in all of these things, I think, uh, includes uh, the intellect um, that, that a person is carrying to achieve high levels of skill in these six areas. Um, the intellectual skill set is including critical thinking, analytical thinking, the ability to synthesize this information and come to a conclusion um, as a result of that analysis. Uh, intellectual curiosity, um, some people would even go so far as to say um, um, skepticism. Um, and um, the ability to construct uh, logical and cogent arguments. Personal qualities, highly motivated. Empathy is, is an extremely important part of this, I think. Uh, the difficulties and obstacles uh, that have been overcome by a candidate, candidate. Practical judgment. I will say this about judgment. I think um, in those three questions that I say we're answering, uh, the, the academic skill set questions, and then that uh, what more is the candidate bringing by virtue of life experience question, there's two others that I think that are important. Uh, one is what is the judgment that this person has demonstrated in, um, in the time prior to coming to law school that shows that they are prepared to be put in a position of exercising good judgment for somebody that they're gonna be representing. And sometimes often the people there, or sometimes the people they're representing are needing a lawyer because as a client, they haven't exercised good judgment. So that, that practical good judgment is a very important part of that. Showing initiative. Uh, integrity and honesty. Uh, then the communication, you're, you're the, the toolbox that you are using as a lawyer is one that consists of, of, of words and punctuation and grammar and, um, and a lot of the work that you will be doing is written work. So do you write effectively and persuasively? Uh, your oral communication skills. Um, I think among the best uh, people who write, the write best, um, often they're also very uh, very attentive and thoughtful listeners. So thinking about that. Task management, time management, that's a, that's a big part of what you will be doing in law uh, and in law school is learning how to work efficiently through problems and, and, and getting the work done. And then working with others. Civility is a big part of the training in law these days. Now the criteria. Uh, four broad areas as we look at them. Things like the academic factors, LSAT scores and undergraduate GPA, we've, we've talked about those, but also advanced work. Have you done degrees uh, at the master's or PhD or other levels, uh, other disciplines uh, that will contribute and demonstrate to us that you've honed skills? Sometimes that's an area in which people have, if they've not performed as well on, on the numbers in their undergraduate program, they can mitigate or, or improve their chances by having gone to graduate school and done very well there. The major, uh, the kind of uh, undergraduate degree you have comes into play in that we know, for example, someone who has a degree in physics has probably had a different set of academic challenges faced before them than somebody who has a degree in social recreation. Now, I do want to make the point that I'm not putting down people who have degrees in recreation or, or social recreation. Um, we do have the Wallace Degner Center for Land Resources and the Environment, and we have candidates with those kinds of degrees background, recreation management degrees, land management degrees, um, but we know that the coursework between physics and that are, are, are going to be different in the nature of, of how challenging uh, they are. Um, so that goes to the difficulty of coursework. Uh, the quality or high school academic experience, family educational history, something like somebody being a first generation college student or somebody having come from a socioeconomic background that uh, can uh, that has affected the, the foundational 
educational experience they had through high school and did that have an impact on early college performance, those kinds of things. Leadership and extracurricular factors. Uh, what has the person done to develop these things? Um, we know that lawyers will often become leaders in the community and leaders in, 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 in the state and, and national government. And so we're looking for a uh, commitment to civic engagement and honing skills even uh, prior to entering law school. Then the demographic and diversity factors that somebody could be bringing to the law school. And that's where I think that third question of what more have you uh, experienced in life by virtue of those experiences and background that's going to enhance the perspectives that you bring into the law schools to, to improve and expand on the discussions and the issues presented in those classroom discussions. That's a big part of uh, the professional education that you'll be going to and an ability to kind of work among different communities, whether they be clients, uh, fellow associates or attorneys or the judges or jury members that you're working with as an attorney. And then the high level of special skills and talents you may have developed through accomplishments. I'm going to go to the questions and see what we have. Okay, here's a question that uh, relates to some of what we're talking to. Let's say my major is in the College of Letters and Sciences, but I took a computer science class for fun, which happened to be my lowest grade too. Do you pay attention to the received, to the grades received based on major and why the GPA may have decreased? Um, yeah, we'll see that. And I think that's an important part of um, evaluating the materials that you will be submitting to us before we see them and anticipate the kinds of questions we would ask. Um, I will sometimes see this in a transcript, but not even though it, it may have been a class taken for fun, it may, for example, in the university setting, uh, be a class that shows up as having been taken in the Department of Continuing Education, uh, not in the Computer Science Department. So I'll, I'll be able to note that on the transcript that this was even a different part of the college campus that you were taking the class on. If it's a single poor performance, and the person has you know, 120 credit hours that are used to compute the GPA, the reality is that one poor performance isn't gonna draw down the GPA too much. If it's a series of this, or if it represents a pattern of behavior, then it might catch my attention and the person who um, uh, has that grade along with some others might have um, something that they need to talk about either in the addendum or the personal statement in regard to if there's fluctuation in the academic performance. The question we may have in mind is which is the student we're going to get in the law school, the person who's kind of at the lower level of that fluctuation or the higher level and why? Uh, something to think about there. And the next question is, I finished my associates in high school and will be finishing my bachelor's in two years. So graduating spring 2021, I want to apply for school for fall 21. I have a couple of internships and a good GPA. I'll be taking the LSAT in June. Will I be less competitive candidate because of my lack of experience? Um, that's a great question. And I, the answer to that is no, um, but it also uh, includes, uh, it depends. And so I don't think it will make you a less competitive candidate because by virtue of having graduated maybe even a little bit earlier, um, we understand that you haven't lived a long enough life to have more things on your resume. But in terms of what time you have had, um, we're going to have an expectation that you will have done very well. Essentially, your job has been being a student for the last four years. And so we're going to be looking at how good of a student have you been for the last four years. I think it would be fair for me to say that on the numbers academically, our candidates who have um, applied to us right out of undergraduate may have a slightly, slightly higher GPA and LSAT score than our candidates who have been admitted and happen to be in their 30s, mid 30s, uh, or late 20s. And part of that goes into uh, the fact that one, um, over a course of time, there's a bit of grade inflation that occurs. So there's just this natural progression in grades going higher um, um, uh, compared to people who graduated five, 10 years ago. 
And then secondly, in answering that third question, what more is this candidate bringing to the law school by virtue of their life experience, backgrounds, and interests, somebody who's had a career has worked for a good period of time and in many cases been out of college, undergraduate school, uh, they've been out longer than they were in, adds a story for them to work with, either in their personal statement or their, their resume. So we're, we're looking at you as two different candidates in that regard. Um, hope that answers your question. Um, let me get to the content and then this is where I'll be able to pick up some of the LSAT and then cash report questions. Um, although I will say um, for Stephanie uh, Ghetto, um, why do schools ask about other schools an applicant is applying to? Will revealing this information help students or does it not make a difference? It doesn't really make a difference. Um, what we look at it for is, are we still seeing the same kind of schools with the can't common applications? Um, sometimes if we're seeing schools um, that very regularly show up on our applications, we know we're kind of in a realm of schools. Uh, and so for example, prior to becoming, um, part of the Pac-12 and doing a lot of recruiting in California, we didn't see a lot of schools um, from the Pac-12 as common applicants, but now very regularly, now um, we're seeing, um, uh, so we, we used to see Arizona schools fairly regularly and Colorado very regularly, but they were in like our top five. And now they're probably in our top two to three schools in terms of the candidates who apply to us commonly. But we're also seeing on a much more regular basis, the University of Washington, the University of Oregon, uh, Berkeley and UCLA um, showing up as common applicant schools. So that lets us know in an application year kind of what other schools or candidates comparing us to and, and having a sense of where we are in the pecking order of things. Sometimes it also makes sense if somebody is applying to us and if they say they're applying to us for the Wallace Stegner Center, we're looking at have they also applied to other well-known environmental law programs? And does that make sense for, for what the, the applicant is, is telling us? So that's how it plays. But if somebody chooses not to answer them, it, it, it doesn't affect them. It's, it's not a required part of the, of the application. Okay, application form. Let me get back to uh, the, um, the PowerPoint. Um, for the application form, uh, fill it up. Uh, and try to fill it out as if you can um, using the space on the application, uh, not leaving blanks. Um, we we review these and it's helpful for us to be able to read the application form and then move on to the next section. It makes it kind of um, difficult as we review files if a person just answers different sections with see the resume and then we have to go to a different PDF, open that up and try and find where that is answered. Um, it's, it's a, I'll say it's a convenience to us. And if we have to keep going back and forth, by the time we get into April of the review cycle, we're kind of tired of that. And you really don't want us to be tired and annoyed when we're reading your file. So just fill out the application form and the questions that have asked, that'll help us, it'll make us happy. Um, uh, the, the application fee, uh, we're gonna waive your fee, so you don't have to worry about that, but uh, pay attention to those. Uh, make sure that you understand if uh, an application fee is due, um, that you're paying it or seek out uh, an application fee waiver. So uh, we get the questions all the time. So don't hesitate to call or email schools asking them about um, if they're willing to waive your application uh, or uh, application fee. Uh, you'll find that I think a lot of schools are more than happy to do so. We understand how expensive it is. Resume, um, that is helpful information. I think um, I'm gonna take a step back and talk about the application as a whole right now. The you know the questions that we're asking, uh, because I told you there's the three questions that include uh, academic skills, the, ac the, the life experience and background question, that judgment implicit, that question about judgment that you've demonstrated. We're also wondering about patterns of behavior. Knowing the things that we're asking in our minds as we review your file, think about how you're putting together all the elements of your file contents and what's the questions that are being asked on the form um, how you're presenting yourself perhaps in a resume or in a, in a personal statement. If, for example, you're going to be talking about your commitment to community or public service, and that's what you want to go to law school for, um, make sure your resume is complementary to that. And what I mean is that it, it adds evidence 
remember who your audience is, people who are legally trained. We like evidence. It adds evidence to what is being purported in your resume, but make sure, or your resume is adding evidence to what is being purported in your personal statement, but make sure your personal statement is not just an essay version of your resume. That everything, especially the, th the six things that are showing up on your screen, should be playing a positive independent role in our evaluation of you as a candidate. And while the academics and the numbers are very important, these are the, how you present yourself as a whole are the kinds of things that will also help make you more competitive so for some of our larger scholarships um, in a way that uh, goes beyond the numbers or um, makes us be able to say there's so many strengths in these areas that the, the, the academics, as long as that first question is answered positively, are such that we're willing to make a decision that says this person may not be at or above our medians. Remember, medians have half the numbers below, that we're willing to have this person be a part of that group. Um, so make sure all of the elements of your file contents are playing a, a positive, important, independent role. Um, so with that in mind, make sure your uh, resume has all the elements that we ask you to include in it in terms of employment, schools attended, honors and awards. Um, I myself personally um, like the, the personal information. Uh, I know I've had uh, faculty committee members just say, you know, they really don't care. and That's, that's fine. Um, but it's one of those things that helps me feel like I get to know a person a little bit more if I know what their hobbies and interests are in that regard. Um, letters of recommendation. I want to spend a moment on those. The um, letters of recommendation uh, can play a very important part in the decision making process, but I think um, this is where I see what I call my most common mistake or the most common mistake in the reviewing of files uh, made by the candidate, and that is the mistake of neutrality. Uh, I think there's great potential for information and a benefit to be made for the applicant in the letters of recommendation, but because often letter writers, um, by virtue of having form letters already on their computer, that unless a candidate gives them helpful information, they'll just go to that template or that form letter, fill in the blanks and send it off. And this is where the, the mistake of neutrality comes into play. Uh, in most cases, uh, a letter that is neutral in effect is one that'll include you know, the letterhead from the, the school where the, the, the person has taught, because often it's uh, from, from a professor, uh, the department they teach in, the classes they taught you in, the grades you got in the class, um, and then the fact that they're recommending you for admission to law school. Well, we know where you went to school because we have your transcripts. Uh, we know what classes you took because we have your transcripts. We know what grade you got in those classes because we have your transcripts. And so what that letter writer is doing is just confirming information we already know. And ultimately, that's just information that the letter writer is giving us that is neutral in effect because we already have that information someplace else. So this is my recommendation in approaching a letter of recommendation. Um, First, change its name. I always suggest people call these letters of evaluation. Uh, by putting that word evaluation in your head and mentioning it to the letter writer, you're signaling them to them what you want them to do with the letter that they're submitting on your behalf. Um, so think about people who have known you in ways that are able, that in which they are able to evaluate you. Um, and it's these. What people have observed you demonstrating these skills, right? Or know you in these ways. Um, once you've selected uh, those letter writers, um, make sure you go to them and ask them in a setting in which if they feel like they may want to, um, that, that no others are around. Um, so that if uh, you, when you ask this question, uh, they politely declined, it's, it's not a pressure situation. And make sure that when you ask them the question, it goes like this. I'm applying to law school from next year and I would, I need an excellent letter of evaluation. And I was wondering if you would please write that excellent letter of evaluation for me. Um, you will definitely find people who are really enthusiastic about doing that. But I think it's important to use the word excellent and evaluation so that you let them know up front what your expectation is. Once they say yes, uh, ask to meet with them and schedule a time for at least half an hour, uh, maybe 45 minutes. Um, to that meeting, you should take uh, a list of the schools that you're applying to, 
uh, be prepared to talk about why you want to go to law school and why you've selected those schools as the schools you're applying to. Uh, a copy of your uh, LS, uh, your CAS report, uh, a copy of your resume, and if you've already completed it, a copy of your personal statement. That way they can see the information that we are seeing uh, and you can talk and walk them through that information. And I think it's very important to let them know where you fit within the competitive pool that um, of the schools that you're applying with. And that way, if necessary, they can go to bat for you. There's going to be a range of schools that you're that you're applying to in most cases. And some of the schools are going to be a very competitive on the number. Some schools are going to be in the middle. There's you know pretty good likelihood of admission, but by no means is it guaranteed. And then there's going to be some schools that you're going to be reaching for. And so I think it's important to acknowledge to that letter writer that there's some schools that you're going to need to be going to bat. This person will need to go to bat for you or really support you and basically making an argument that if you're not at the medians of that institution, it's their opinion that you're stronger than what those medians suggest and why. So really help them write that well-informed letter. Um, Another one of the challenges I have is, especially if you have a character and fitness uh, issue that you may be challenged with in the application process, or something that really jumps out as um, uh, a, a, a difficult semester or a poor LSAT score, um, make sure they're aware of that. Because sometimes when I'm reading letters of recommendation that are really, really strong, while on one hand, the letter may be uh, impressive in how effusive the person is in in talking about the, the the candidate in very positive way. A thought that sometimes goes through my mind if I know that there's a character and fitness issue or there's just kind of a very obvious challenge in the academic information that if this person doesn't acknowledge the existence of that, I wonder would this person write the same letter if they know what I know about this candidate? And by acknowledging that somewhere in the letter, then I know that, that that letter will have more credibility associated with it because the letter writer is aware of the information that I have. So two thoughts on letters of recommendation. Before I go to the personal statement, I'm going to go through some of your questions. Um, oh, first one, uh, the uh, question on uh, letters of recommendation. For our school, uh, we require one letter of recommendation. We'll take up to three. And for other law schools, I'd say pay attention to the instructions. Um, and this is one of the areas that we may be changing next year. Uh, we let you submit uh, any, uh, a letter from any recommender that you choose. Uh, we may be requiring a, a letter from, come from an academic source or what are sometimes called dean's letters. Dean's letters are from the dean of students at the school you graduated from and it's the dean of students who is asserting that there have or has not been any academic or disciplinary issues with your student record. Um, but for now our policy is we require one letter, we'll take up to three, uh, and generally speaking, if the person is a recent college graduate, the expectation that is that one or two of those letters come from academic sources. Uh, when will the winner of the free LSAT prep class be announced? And will that be before the May 5th session? Uh, my understanding is it will be before the May 5th session. If you go to the website links, uh, there should be contact information. Uh, there, just uh, uh, send an email or call the office tomorrow when they're open tomorrow, and uh, they should be able to answer their question. Typically, they let people know when we've had in-person sessions, there's literally a drawing. They'll usually call them two or three days after uh, the class, our, our, our workshop has completed. Um, but be patient. As I mentioned, the University of Utah as a campus is uh, closed. Everything's online, so people are working remotely. Letters. I'll get to that with the first one. Emily, I'm sorry I'm taking so long to get to your letter, your question. It's a great question, but I want to use the cash form to, to, to answer it. Um, from uh, the last one, I did a 16 hour uh, week internship, and while working and being a student, due to financial reasons, I was unable to continue my unpaid internship. I'm especially worried that I will not be able to find a job in law field for my gap year. How heavily do you judge applicants that decide to work in an area unrelated to law? Um, uh, the first thing I want to do is put you at ease in saying we do not have an expectation that people have experience of working in law or spending their gap year working in a law firm or doing something legally oriented. Um, 
We know that there's very different life circumstances that we all face. And that depending on a person's life circumstance, uh, they may not be in a position to afford an unpaid internship, or they may not be in a position to pay, take a lower paying job at a law firm as a runner versus um, making some pretty good money roofing houses. You know, it, it, you know it, it, we, we have an appreciation for that. And quite frankly, all those experiences are going to contribute to the law school experience that a person brings. Uh, the summer before I went to law school, I was pouring cement side for sidewalks at a public school district in Texas. Um, and so uh, I think what you're bringing to the law school experience and the things that you list on your resume and how you talk about that perspective that you're going to bring um, are what we're looking for in terms of the context that you will be able to bring into the discussion of, of the law school classes. And those, that can play out in very different ways in very different uh, class settings. And just know that law is so interdisciplinary that there's going to be an opportunity to contribute your life experiences in a variety of, of class settings um, in, in, in that. So don't feel that you're going to be disadvantaged by having not had experience in the law field. Um, if you, I, I, I would say though, that if you have the opportunity, it may benefit you more than us. And what I mean by that is it may benefit you as a, as an, as a person thinking about law school and becoming an attorney to be able to get, um, firsthand or eyewitness perspective on what happens in a law office on a day-to-day -day basis or in, you know, a, a district attorney's office. Uh, or a single or a solo practitioner's office, just so you have an idea of what, once you get out of law school, what is your day-to-day -day life going to be like? And having that experience before your law school will hopefully solidify, or in some cases, have you question, is this the path I really want to take? And so if you can't do it full-time or on a long-term basis, at the very least, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to um, either pre-law organizations, perhaps a pre-law advisor's office, and find out if there's attorneys or tours that you can take or opportunities to shadow uh, attorneys to see kind of over the course of one or two days, what is it that they actually do so you have a sense of whether you think this is going to be a good fit for you or not. But I don't think you should worry about not having something law-oriented on your resume um, and having that be a disadvantage. I do want to add a caveat to that after having said that though. If it appears from your academic record and your resume and other elements of your application that you are walking a, an entirely different path on your way to law school, that everything shows that you should have gone to dental school, that you know, you're a biochemistry major, you volunteered at a dental office, um, you, you know, everything says dental school. And then all of a sudden we get this application to law school and we're wondering why is this person applying to law school? Then you should have something in your personal statement or somewhere that shows us why you've elected to go down this path. You know, if it looks like you're making a 180 degree turn to come to law school, um, it's like anticipating that question in a job interview. You know the resume you've submitted them. Um, you know what the job description is. They're going to ask you some questions about how well you fit in for the job. And then they're also going to ask you some questions about, well, why do you want to do this? And be prepared to answer that kind of question, especially if it looks like you were preparing to do something else along the way. All right. Um, I'm going to jump to the cash report because I think that leads to the discussion about the personal statement or, or it segues to that discussion a little bit better. Um, the cash report, the credential assembly service report, as those earlier slides alluded to, is a report that compiles all of your uh, transcripts, letters of recommendation, that kind of information. Um, with your transcripts, what they will do is they will receive those transcripts, verify their authenticity, and then data enter all the information from those transcripts. This is a sample law school report from a fictitious person, but just to ensure that this fictitious person shall remain nameless, we've blacked out the information. But it shows um, what that information as it's become compiled will look like. And you'll be surprised at all the academic information we pull even just from this one page cover sheet that is attached to your um, transcripts. 
And let me just walk you through those. And as I walk you through these, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the, the questions that are being asked about the credit, no credit, um, and, 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 and uh, the, the cash report. I may have accidentally deleted a question. Let me go back to the answers here because I want to make sure I'm not leaving any questions unanswered for you guys. So, oh, there was a first generation question that I'll talk. Um, there's a question about, uh, do we mention first generation status or other in our personal statement or uh, do we check a box for it? Short answer is both. I think um, we put it on our application form so that you know that's something that matters to us but how it mattered to you and your upbringing and perhaps our evaluation of your record is something you should be prepared to articulate to us, either in a diversity statement, an addendum, or your personal statement. I think that was uh, um, the question that I accidentally uh, dismissed. Okay. Um, this section of the law school report, uh, basic biographical information, um, person's uh, birthday, application name, uh, previous name. I will say that this person is a male and it's fairly unusual to see a name, a male with a previous name. So this is something that might catch my eye on something I would say. Uh, for females, less so in terms of maiden names, things like that, that's more common. Um, age of the candidate, race, ethnicity. Um, for our purposes as a state school, I think it's helpful to know that, you know, somebody claims, we know that there's an advantage to residents of the state of Utah, especially as it relates to the tuition that they will be paying if they come to school here and they're classified as a Utah resident. Sometimes I'll have a question about somebody claiming to say be a New York resident on their application, uh, on their law school report. And then when I open their application form that they filled out for us, they're claiming to be a Utah resident. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's gonna automatically be bad, but it's one of those things uh, that I'll be like, you know, what's, is there something going on here? A real simple answer that often happens is um, they came here for undergraduate as non-resident and just haven't changed their driver's license. Or maybe they're stationed at Hill Air Force Base as a pilot or a military person in the Air Force. And um, the thing about that is uh, when you're stationed in a state for tuition purposes or state school purposes, you're automatically considered a resident of that state even though you can claim your permanent residency for taxes and others. So that's you know, an easy explanation there. This is uh, the section that in lets us know what institutions this person attended. This person attended a lot, it looks like, and what degrees they earned. So this person earned a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from Hobart, and then went on to get a master's at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. So um, that isn't this, that isn't shown here under the major because it's a graduate degree. So I'm gonna to need to look at the transcripts to see what this person earned, um, as well as the resume will often tell us what, what that, that graduate degree is in. The thing that would catch my eye here is there's a lot of schools this person attended. So I'm also gonna be paying close attention to whether or not there's unacknowledged transcripts here. And I'll talk about that in a moment. This section lets us know notations from the, the transcripts that the person who did the data entry for all this information is, is, is drawing to our attention. So for this school 2294, this person who was ninth, number 47 in a graduating class of 492, so they did well, they the high ranking, uh, top 10% performance. Um, but then from this 277, there's an unacknowledged transcript. So Somewhere in the information that, of this, that the student has submitted, there is an indication that this person attended um, Rutgers University, University College in New Brunswick, but they didn't disclose that in their application material. So that's, that's showing up as an unacknowledged transcript. And so that's an unacknowledged trans transcript is not a good thing. Um, basically, it makes your file incomplete until that transcript is submitted. We do our best to make sure that if this happens, we'll reach out to the candidate and say, you've got an unacknowledged transcript, you need to have that sent in. If it raises some other questions, we may also ask that person to submit a statement as to why they didn't submit this transcript initially. Um, often it's just something that's been overlooked and it can be understood as you know, a person did concurrent enrollment and they just forgot about it uh, since high school was so long ago but we get that information and, and, and know that you need to pay attention to that. Academic action lets us know at this school, this person got into some kind of trouble, probably academic suspension or probation. 
Um, and uh, we should be looking at the transcript for that information. And at this school, there's term action. And what term action refers to is it may be disciplinary, you know, not just, uh, um, or, or student behavioral action, not just academic. So we're gonna wanna pay, pay close attention to that, that transcript. And then for this school, 2263, um, sorry, the, for this school, 2263, this applicant acknowledged that this school is one that they attended, but that school refused to release the transcript because um, the student still has a financial obligation that has not been paid off. So pay off your trans, pay off your trial parking tickets. Um, and so these are the notations that can show up. There's over 3,000 universities and colleges in the United States, and I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I don't know all of them. I know those that our students regularly come from, but this section where it says degree school at least lets us know grading patterns, percentage distributions of GPAs, how many of the people in the application process over the last three years that applied to law school have distribution of GPAs in these areas. And for kind of your kind of average school, it'll be a bell-shaped curve. There'll be more schools, you know, there'll be more numbers here in the middle, and then it'll trail off as you go up the grading scale, and then it'll trail off as you go down the grading scale. Some schools will have a bunch of numbers here, and those will be schools um, that are um, schools that have a fair amount of grade inflation, or schools that just have really strong students. You're gonna have schools, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, they'll, they'll have really high numbers up here. And then the same is true for the LSAT. For over about the last three year period, for all the students who graduated from the school, how many performed in this portion of the percentile band of the LSAT? So at this school, two people had LSATs in the 95th percentile and up, and then the 90 to 94th. And so here again, you'll see a normal bell-shaped distribution for more, most schools and other schools who have them skewed to the high end some will be skewed to the low end. That'll give us a little bit of information about the student body as it relates to those who have chosen to apply to a professional high stakes program. And then here's the year by year data uh, that we'll get on the student uh, for where they were schooled. So this is the school year, 1981, Arcadia. Um, uh, this is the school uh, that he had he enrolled for 16 credit hours. And for those 16 credit hours, earned a 3.2 GPA. And then here is the cumulative GPA that we see come across the board. So going to some of the questions, of, and then um, this goes year by year, school by school. So we can see the grade trend. We can see if the cumulative GPA vacillates, goes up and down or stays steady, improves, declines. We can also see the college average. So he, performed, he was performing below average here. He performed slightly above average here and slightly below average at the college institution there. So um, there's a lot of information even in just this section here. This portion tells us uh, the number of grades they got by credit hour. So we know that uh, Arcadia, he got um, eight credits of A um, and six credits of B and zero credits and then had a D and then the total credits earned at that institution in that time period. So we can see the distribution of A's. So um, this is where that information on this page will show up for people this year who may take, be taking a whole semester's worth of credit, no credit, or pass-fail credit. It'll be under this unconverted category. And so Emily asked the question, Given the recent events at the university now allowing credit, no credit in place of traditional letter grades, how will the Quinney College of Law be evaluating students who opt for this pass-fail graded semester? We'll be able to notice initially that this is going to be the section for or for the year 2019-20, but there's a lot of unconverted credit. We could go to the back uh, and, and look at the attached uh, transcript. My understanding is that the university will probably have a notation on the transcript indicating that this was the semester of the pandemic <clears throat> and the university had a policy that allowed students to take uh, the entire semester's uh, coursework as credit, no credit. And those of us who have been working in admissions, higher education admissions, just not law school admissions, are fully aware that many, many uh, universities across the United States, and I would go so far as to say it's looking like maybe even a majority, um, are creating policies that are going to either mandate or give options for candidates for 
very well founded, founded reasons, the option to either take the semester uh, for a graded credit, complete the semester for pass fail credit, or withdraw without pun uh, with with no punitive marks on their record. Just have a uh, have a withdraw. Um, my my first recommendation is do what is best for you, especially from a mental health standpoint, and know that we're going to be aware that this was a very unique semester in your academic history. And I would not anticipate that this would, uh, uh, based on just its face value, negatively impact you on, on in the application process. Um, with that said, I don't think you can say that this is going to advantage you in the process. I don't think it would be fair for me to say, let's say a student was uh, on the uptick of their GPA and would a school say, oh, they've been improving their GPA by 0.2 every semester. And so last semester they had gone, you know, for the two previous semesters, they had gone from a 2.4 to a two, from a, from a three, four to a three, six. And if they kept on that trend, they would be at three, eight this semester. Um, I don't think we're gonna jump to that conclusion. We would just say, we're not gonna negatively impact you by seeing that there's pass fail. So one of the things you may want to think about if you, especially if you had a weak start for whatever reason, if you were counting on this semester to be one of three semesters where you had really marked improvement, you may have a tough decision to make. And I think schools would be willing to listen to your explanation. And this is where I'm going to say um, there's a difference between what we see on a transcript by itself and what you explain to us. There's going to be opportunity for you to explain your circumstance. And so in the example that I was just giving you, if you have uh, a history where you, for whatever reason, um, you did not perform well early, but you've since uh, your first, or, you know, first couple of semesters have really improved your performance steadily, and that that steady improvement has been a marked one, a marked one. Um, be prepared to write something in your personal statement or in an academic uh, or an addendum that would. Um, explain your situation. And one of the things that we've been dealing with at the law school is trying to find a way to recognize the circumstance that students are in by virtue of having to leave either their dorms or their apartments and be in a setting now where they don't have the best study situation, that maybe they're sharing a computer or during the online class, there's kids who are running around the house because they're home from school also. And that's gonna impact their ability to perform well um, and we're going to listen to that explanation. Um, its impact is going to be just like regular admissions relative to what the rest of the pool is looking like and how you're competing. But know that we're going to be sensitive to that and we're going to be reading your story and understanding where you're coming from. And we appreciate the tough decisions you're going to have to make in electing whether you want to take graded credit or pass fail credit. Um, and uh, if, if you have any more concerns or would like to give me more specific information to talk to you about that, um, don't hesitate to, to give me a call or shoot me an email. That information, I believe, was on the first slide. I will give it to you all again uh, as we wrap up. I hope this, helpful, this answer was helpful to you, Emily. If not, like I said, I'm willing to, to talk to you offline about this. Um, question about... Quick question. I'm not sure if you answered this already, uh, but will SJ Quinney require both a personal and diversity statement or just one? We require a personal statement and the diversity statement is a voluntary one that you can choose to submit or not. In our diversity statement description, we do say that if you already talk about the, what you would include in a diversity statement in your personal statement, then just submit the personal statement. But if your personal statement does not include information about the diversity you would contribute to the law school, then we do encourage uh, that diversity statement. Does being an in-state applicant or an out-of-state applicant affect the admission decision? Um, I call that kind of the red herring. Uh, we do want to have, uh, we are a state sports school. We do want to have a majority of our students be residents of the state of Utah. Um, our 
our our resident versus non-resident pool actually uh, it's a slightly this we had a shift this year in having a, a larger portion of our applicant pool become non-residents uh, but up until this year it was pretty close to 50 50 or 45 55 switching from year to year um, and it really didn't play out in, in a big difference that is our admission ratio was roughly 50 to 50. Um, this year we're up a little bit on, on our out of state offers of admission and I think that's just reflective of the fact that our out of state pool has grown substantially this reason, this, uh, this year. Um, but the reality is we're not advantaging or disadvantaging either category. It's, it's, it's just a status, it'll affect tuition, but it's not determinative or does not in, in wait an answer or wait a decision ultimately. With that said, I should not have said ultimately. With that said, I will acknowledge that, for example, on our wait list, if it looks like we're um, uh, off the balance that we seek in enrolling the class uh, with a majority of resident students, being an, a resident in a year in which we're low on, non -re low on residents is going to advantage somebody who happens to be on the wait list, uh, but we're not there yet, and that can change from year to year. Um, next question, who do you recommend would be great choices to write letters of recommendation or evaluation? Uh, going back to the um, skill set and criteria, people who know you or can talk about the contributions you can make in the school, either through your excellence in academics, leadership, demographic diversity factors, but most importantly, can talk to us and evaluate the academic skill set you're bringing to our program. Um, with that said, I would acknowledge that for some people, um, they are making a strong argument for themselves in the application process based on an area of law that they have an interest in. And so the easiest example here would be somebody who wants to go into public service law or maybe um, a very specific area of public service or public interest law. Let's say they want to be, um, they want to work in the guardian ad litem's office representing the interest of children in very difficult cases. Uh, sometimes cases in which uh, the parental rights of a mother or father or both are being terminated. Um, that's really hard work um, and emotionally trying work. And if somebody is applying to law school and they're saying that's the work they want to do and they know what they're getting into because they were working in a child welfare office for the state office, you know, the, the, the DCFS, the, the Department of Child and Family Services, um, and they saw that um, and they know kind of the difficulty of the work, but that's what they want to do and they're committed to. Having a letter writer from that area in which they work can back up and as a strategy confirm this person's commitment to that type of work. So that's also something to think about in selecting your letter writers in terms of how are they supporting the strategy you are employing and how you present yourself in the application process. Um, so uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, now to the personal statement. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that it's, it's probably going to be one of the toughest parts of the application process. And like the letters of recommendation, this may be an area that we are going to change in our um, uh, policies. I'll say uh, previously we had a policy that there was no word count or page limitation on the personal statement that candidates submitted. Um, and we've thought about this and we're considering limiting it to say a, a, a maximum two page personal statement or putting a word count on that. Uh, decision hasn't been made final and it will of course be included in the instructions for next year's application as we, um, as you look at that. But uh, the personal statement plays a very important role. I'll start with what I mentioned earlier uh, in regard to what a personal statement should not be. And it should not be an essay version of the resume. Uh, that's information we already have. Um, beyond that, uh, the rules are there are no rules in my opinion. And that, and that means um, I can't tell you what you should be saying in your personal statement or what we expect you to say because I don't know any of you uh, well enough to say this is the kind of thing that makes, will make you interesting to us. But I think it would be helpful to look at the slides uh, when you access them 
for the criteria and an academic skill set and think about everything I've talked about in regard to all the other elements of the application and and in your mind's eye or literally um, when you get ready to, to brainstorm about your personal statement spread everything out in front of you that we're going to require you to submit to us your transcripts uh, your um, your resume the our completed application form um, uh, if you have access to them the letters of recommendation sometimes people who write letters of recommendation will give you a copy of what they, they're, they're going to be sending and with all the information that we're requiring you to submit to us other than the personal statement knowing those three questions we start off with the two academic skill set questions and the experience and background question say what does all this information say about me in answering those three questions and you may find that um, by simply asking that question of yourself it'll give you direction for the content of your personal statement you know they're going to want to know this or they're going to have questions about that or i need to talk about why i want to go to law school because when i spread everything out in front of me it looks like i was getting ready to go to medical school um, but, but you'll get some direction because I, it may be easy to now easier by making this an analogy um, think of it as you know these documents are painting a portrait or creating a sculpture of you and in the in the portrait of the sculpture that has been developed with all this information what's missing that is really about you that we don't know in regard to everything else we've required you to submit to us and that may give you some direction to your personal statement um, and by giving you some direction then you've got something to work with uh, think of a theme or a point you're going to be trying to make with us as you as as we're reading this personal statement and then sit down and write and say, you know, my theme for this personal statement is X, and that's the point I want to get across. Um, write out your personal statement, uh, go through three or four drafts, and once uh, you've completed those three or four drafts, start passing it around. Um, pass it around to one or two people who know you really well, and, and definitely include somebody whose writing you respect or you know writes well. Um, but don't tell any of them about the, what you hope for them to get out of it or what you hope for us to get out of it. Just say it's your personal statement for law school. Then meet with each of those people individually. And after they've read it, say, what did you get out of it? And if they tell you what you want us to have gotten out of it, you're on track. Um, if they tell you something completely different, then we're probably not going to be able to, to get what you're hoping for us to get out of that personal statement. Um, if that's the case, then let them know what you're hoping for them to, to take away from that, that reading and then ask them, especially if they're those one or two people that know you very well, what could you have included to get, get them there, to get them to that thought process that you were hoping we'd come away with. Um, and that, that can be very helpful. The person who writes really well, uh, anticipate that they're going to be looking at it for that, that writing eye, you know, are using the right tone, are using grammar, um, formality, um, uh, passive versus active voice, those kinds of things, and, and, and look for their help in those ways. And then, um, and then you know, take that back and, and work on it some more before you submit it to us. Um, let me get to some of the questions again. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who has a low undergraduate GPA, but who has work experience? Um, um, that's almost like that one question that asked about the 15 point LSAT. Um, know that there's more information that we're going to ask of you. And one of the best ways to counterbalance a lower GPA is to do really well on the LSAT. So make sure that you put time and effort into preparing as well as you can to sit for the LSAT. Uh, and do as well as you can, hopefully just that first time. Uh, if you contemplate second, uh, second taking of the LSAT, you need to look to that first experience and say, what can you change either about the process or the experience that will assure you of improving that? And then in terms of that work experience, that's part of that strategy that I was talking about for a letter writer. If, if you're going to have a strategy about saying, my work experience is something that I'm going, that's gonna to contribute to the law school by virtue of my life experience, background and interests, and enhance the class that I'm part of, um, make sure you work that into how your personal statement reads, who your letter writers are, um, and recognize um, that even if that's going to be a major part of how you present yourself, you still have to be answering those first two questions of have, how well have you demonstrated that person, that, that, that academic skill set, 
and include somewhere in that conversation with us, whether it's an addendum or in that personal statement or asking your letter writers to go to bat for you, um, the measures that they, um, the measures that we should be taking of you in your demonstrated academic skills that go beyond the GPA. Um, and uh, I hope that that was helpful. Um, here again, I'm always happy to, to, to answer questions offline or in the phone call if you want more detail. Um, do AP scores also, also have to be submitted if they're already listed on your transcript as credits for general requirements? Nope, uh, they'll show up on your transcript and you will see that it was part of um, what met your graduation requirements for a particular school if they took that credit. Um, another question, I have numerous amounts of leadership experiences uh, throughout my four years of college, currently I'm a paralegal law firm. Besides what I have already mentioned that proves my interest in law, what other experiences would you recommend to strengthen or better my resume and make it stand out? Um, that's a tough one. I think it's not so much what other interests that you can list on there. I always caution people about trying to put a bunch of things to show that you've got a lot of experience. Quite frankly, I'm more I'm more interested in the positive impact you had on an organization uh, by your involvement or your, through your leadership than I am about a whole list of things. Because sometimes what goes through my mind, if I see just a lot of organizations that you belong to and a lot of them in your time with them overlapped, I'm going to think, how did this person have time to really engage with each of these? So I'm always looking for a little bit more of uh, commitment and engagement with a particular organization or two that has benefited by your participation than this kind of litany of, of a, a wide variety of things. So that's, that's, that's what I would suggest in terms of thinking about how you're presenting yourself and your engagement with those organizations or the leadership development um, that you had uh, as, as an undergraduate or currently in your community service. Uh, then the last question on the Q&A, if someone cannot afford to sign up for the LSAT and cash right now because of financial hardship, is the LSAC providing some sort of fee waivers for the summer tests? Um, two parts of that answer. Uh, and uh, the last part is the LSAC providing some sort of fee waivers for the summer test. They have fee waivers um, uh, for any of their tests. And what you should do is go to the LSAC's website at lsac.org and in the internal search engine, type in LSAT fee waiver, and it'll take you to the information page that'll show you what you need to do to qualify for an LSAT fee waiver. If you qualify for it, and one of the things that I think is a pretty good general measure is if you are, or, or if you qualify for a full Pell Grant, chances are you may qualify for an LSAT fee waiver. And with that fee waiver, you get two free LSAT administrations, a waiver of your cash report fee. So those three things right there already add up to almost $600. And then I believe four cash report waivers, those $45 costs per report waivers. So uh, the value of that, of that um, waiver program, if you qualify for it, it you know, approaches seven, $800. So something you should definitely check into. It's a nice enough website to where you can plug in some preliminary information about yourself that they ask about. And if it appears that you qualify, then there's some, there's kind of this official submission that you make, and then they're gonna require you to submit some documents like tax returns and things like that to verify your income. But if you qualify for it, that'll be great. Um, if you've already paid for your LSAT and you apply for an LSAT fee waiver after the fact, you don't get reimbursed uh, for the LSAT that you've paid for. Uh, so be aware of that. And then as I mentioned for schools, definitely reach out to them to have them send you uh, LSAT or their application fee waivers to keep those costs down. In regard to the LSAC's um, uh, or, or LSAT preparation, there's a um, online program that's free that is administered by the Khan Academy. So if any of you who are listening have kids in elementary or junior high, or yourselves, I, I actually have used it sometimes with some questions I've had. They have, um, it's, it's a tutorial program for all kinds of stuff, chemistry, uh, basic English, uh, calculus, and they have um, LSAT prep. The unique thing about this, other, in addition to being free, is they have worked with the Law School Admission Council in developing this program. So you know that they've used actual LSAT tests and they've had access 
in, in, in the sample questions. And they've had access to the psychometricians who actually develop LSAT questions in all elements of the test, the analytical, logical reasoning, as well as the reading comprehension. Um, it's, it's a fairly sophisticated program so that once you register for it, if you put all the information in, you'll do a diagnostic test and it'll get a measure or get a baseline of the areas of the test that you need to work on. And then it'll, depending on how, how many weeks away the next test the administration that you want to take is being offered, it'll give you suggestions on how much time you should be spending on each part of the test in your preparation. So I would strongly encourage you to look at that. Um, and then make maybe the tough decision. I know you say you can't afford it, um, but think about the investment value of doing well on the LSAT. And if the Khan Academy online prep isn't something that works for you because you're more of that live class type learner, I mean, that's the learning environment you excel in, it might be worth investing in something that is a live class. Um, and that may, based on our current situation with the pandemic, mean that you push back when you sit for the LSAT. If you were hoping to sit for it this summer, and that means you're not gonna have access to a live class environment um, until we're through with this, then you might have a tough decision of saying, well, maybe I wait to take the LSAT until fall semester um, in anticipation of this being done with that. Um, there are some things that are fluid in our situation that I just want to acknowledge. I don't have set answers for you or answers that I'm as confident of as I have been in the past. And I apologize for that, but I think um, the circumstances we're in just are going to require us all to be fairly nimble, um, maybe uh, a bit creative in how we approach it. And also recognize that there may be times where a decision is going to be tough because we might have to do something like wait before we apply or apply without um, um, having a sense of what will happen if, for example, I apply late and I get in, but I don't have enough money for a seed deposit. Um, I think one of the most important things to do is um, think these things through as much as you can. Don't hesitate to call the school specifically and ask questions. Um, and, and, and be forgiving of yourself and understanding of the situation that we're all in and, and um, communicate. I think a big part is communicating with all those involved, whether it's your letter writers, your family support system that's surrounding you or the law schools that you're thinking about applying to. Uh, and and we'll, we'll try and work through all this process as we can and, and get through it as successfully as we can. Got a question that just came up. Um, uh, actually, no, that was the LSAT question. Uh, I am done with the PowerPoint and wanted to make sure that um, it wasn't just that last page that was showing up. Let me go ahead and give you all my cell number. Um, please don't hesitate to give me a call. Uh, that's going to be my primary line while I am uh, working from home uh, during this uh, this um, the, the pandemic that we're working with. That's 801. 9139055. And uh, my, my email address is uh, reyes.aguilar at law.utah.edu. Reyes is R E Y E S dot A G U I L A R. I want to thank you uh, for uh, the time you've given us uh, in um, listening to this. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to either contact myself or Isabel. And I hope to meet you in the future and look forward to reviewing your applications. Have a safe uh, and healthy rest of the week.